It was once untouched and untainted, a purity of air, ice, water. Prince William Sound was Earth at its creation. People, but one element of life. Here coexistence bred respect and peace. But one day coexistence bred confusion and a menace from which no flight was possible. between one ship command and the next in a matter of moments. It was as if the ocean had turned to oil. On March 24th, 1989, a tanker leaving this terminal with over a million barrels of oil ran aground on a well-marked reef, causing the largest oil spill in the history of the United States. Dark, thick oil fouled clean, clear water over hundreds of square miles, intruding in one of the world's last remaining pristine environments, a setting of pure majesty, Prince William Sound. I just would have thought that uh, we would have been better prepared for it. The industry, the state, the federal government, everybody. But we were shockingly unprepared. This oil, again, uh, shouldn't be here. Shouldn't be here at all. If the oil companies had done what they promised many years ago, we wouldn't be here today. Alyeska failed to implement the oil spill response plan. It's as simple as that. They don't know how to deal with it. I don't know that they've got anything to gain. It's just that they are darn near incompetent. The ship was the Exxon Valdez, but it could have been any company, any ship, any captain. As shocked officials frantically searched the world for cleanup equipment and technology, the oil spread in a deadly shadow. We came here to find out why it happened and why it should not be allowed to happen again. I am Jean-Michel Cousteau, and this is a Cousteau Society special report. It began on a night like this, a harbor at rest, a captain returning to his ship, a long journey ahead. But within a few hours, an ordinary trip had become an environmental nightmare, an unnatural catastrophe for which no one, despite so-called preparations, was prepared. The Alaska pipeline ends at Prince William Sound, and the oil spread like a virus from Bly Reef into the Gulf of Alaska across wild, rugged islands and virgin national parks, eventually fouling 1,200 miles of coast, roughly the distance between New York 
and Miami. At least 11 million gallons of oil, 20% of the cargo, gushed into pure and rich waters out of control. There was too much oil to burn, not enough dispersant on hand. Toxic marble traveled at will. Too little boom arrived too late to trap a sea of oil. Then waves and tide tossed boom away. On once virgin coasts, black ribbons of oil. I visited Night Island with Dan Lone days after the accident. Just uh, every, everywhere you go, here's another one that's just sitting there. I mean, these rocks have not been probably turned over by hand ever. And you look underneath where that rock came from. Wildlife was overwhelmed. There has been an otter rescue effort here that I believe it has not come to this beach. And the otters that were here, I haven't seen for the last two days. Uh, we have seen uh, a dead otter floating by, so I suspect that uh, those, that wildlife that was here is dead now. Traditionally, the otters and the fishermen have been competing for the same resource. And suddenly, you're seeing all the fishermen uh, picking up otters and trying to save them. What happened? I think they value life. A value, even though at other times we may argue with each other, we have pulled together to protect what we can protect. Uh, there's just something that's happening to people. Well, what, what is it? Respect for life. Those guys are a very little chance, huh? <laughs> Perhaps as many as a million birds would die, the highest toll in birds ever in such accidents. So many the oil-soaked dead were burned to keep healthy creatures from scavenging them. But in valiant rescue efforts, local people brought oiled birds to a makeshift oil spill hospital where scientists and volunteers irrigated bird stomachs. They cleaned with tools from home, water picks for feathers, toothbrushes around tiny eyes. Next door, sick and shivering otters. The fur that normally keeps them warm, now fatally matted with oil, also waited for care. There are over 5,000 in the area, potentially, of the spill, which is quite an overwhelming number of animals to deal with. They have to be captured and brought in. We have quite a few capture boats, and we have good logistical support for the kilos to get them in. But our facilities here are pretty inadequate. What we have found, however, is that the animals are suffering from a toxic uh, reaction to the oil, and that the rehabilitation process may take longer than we thought, and so we face the prospect of a much higher mortality than we had thought. We have developed techniques to clean their fur 
uh, which are pretty effective. But the toxicity is, is uh, I think, now going to cause uh, us more problems. Than Talking about internal problems. Yeah. Lungs and uh, liver damage. We have pathologists, toxicologists that are all rushing up here to help us come to terms with this, but uh, we're having to learn quite a bit as we go. The lung damage, I don't know, that may be untreatable. Normally, a judge and jury use this room to conduct the usual business of justice in Valdez. But the oil spill changed this room into a command post to fight the oil. The fishermen and women of Prince William Sound are now the jury. As to why the oil spill happened, the public will be the judge. Instead of developing energy alternatives, the United States grew increasingly reliant on Prudhoe Bay oil that could be depleted by the end of this decade. Fought by those who feared tanker accidents, the pipeline opened in 1977, snaking across 800 miles. Managed by Alieska, seven oil companies, including Exxon, supposedly accountable for oil spill response. The pipeline carries one-fourth of America's oil to supposedly safe tankers, supposedly kept on course by modern navigation control, the failure of which stunned local people like George Covell. Three, four days after the accident, when they asked the, the Coast Guard people in charge of that whether they could see the tanker out there stuck on the reef belching oil, if they could see it, and they said, yeah, it's on our screen, but they didn't see it that night. So everything just did not work that, that night. Nobody was paying attention. The Coast Guard downgraded its radar in budget cuts and claimed the straying Valdez could not be seen, but with biology's truck or vine, basic vessel radar had the range. So we right off Potato Point. That's right. Right, where are we? Right, right there. here in the center, right off Potato Point. And that's the US Coast Guard's radar station, which is supposed to supervise everything here, right? That's where they watch us. Now from here, we can see on your radar, Bly Reef. That's correct. That's right up here, about 13.1 miles away. So there's no possible confusion. I would think so. Running their own battle, Alaskans worked round the clock to keep the moving slick from fishing grounds, shocked that officials could not. The only contingency plan that Exxon and Alaska has ever seen has only been on paper. There's not a bit of it in reality. It simply doesn't exist in reality. About the only real action that does exist in reality is what the fishermen are doing out here. Now, we have managed to, at this point in time, protect the hatcheries, but that's grace of God in that the weather hasn't been bad. And we need another war to be going on right now in Washington, D.C., so this never happens again. But the thing is, is there's still so much oil in the water, and it's not coming out. They're not doing anything to get it out. Who's they? Exxon. But don't you have meetings together with the, uh, the state and Exxon? And... Beginning to be a joke, the meetings. Yes, we do have meetings every morning and every evening, strategy meetings. So you should know what they're doing or what they're supposed to do. We always know what they're supposed to be doing. They give us all the things that they're supposed to be doing, but it never happens. The reason why we're involved is this is our front yard. We're basically, mm -hmm. we're basically a modern day hunter-gatherer culture. Mm -hmm. And it goes beyond just that it's our living. This is, this is the essence of our life. Mm -hmm. This is the reason why we're here. And uh, we're watching the birds die. We're watching the sea life. Not just, we're not just talking marine mammals here. We're talking the whole water column from the plankton to the herring, salmon, the things that we can't even see are out there dying, and that's just breaking us up. The community fought sadness and chaos with local know-how. My crew was all crab fishermen, and the boat was rigged for crabbing, and we knew how to tow stuff, went tie knots, and we were the only one of the only boats around that really had the expertise to do it and the crew to do it. And then we started trying to put booms out, and Exxon had sent us booms, and they sent us a bunch of junk. It was stuff that had been on the North Slope for the last 10 years they've been practicing with. 
was good boom, it was just wore out, the pieces weren't here. Nobody that was here really knew how to put it together. Nobody that was here knew really knew anything about anchoring boom or, or using boom. So the fishermen more or less had to take over explaining how to anchor booms to them. And there's plenty of blame to go around. Uh, everybody can beat up Exxon, they're easy. But when you, I believe when they get into this that the state of Alaska is as much to blame as anybody and maybe the federal government for believing that we're grown-ups up here and we can take care of ourselves. As to the best technology available, the world watched a giant company and the most powerful nation on Earth meet their most tragic oil spill with paper towels, hands and knees, a single rock at a time. By mid-spring, Exxon had at last mobilized a massive cleanup. 1,400 boats, 85 aircraft, 12,000 people, nearly $2 billion. Money now trying to make up for lack of ready response. High pressure hoses loosen only some of the oil. Only 12% of the spill was recovered. What we're doing, we start with a cold water wash. We're using seawater. We pump it out with different pumps that we have on the barges and the different boats. And we wash it with hot water. Then we reflood it with cold water. We work up with the tide, and we follow the tide back down. This piece we're working on, this is the second wash for it. It re oiled during the night. Exxon is doing everything possible, all the manpower and pumps, hoses we can get, we're working on it. And I think when we leave here, will have done a pretty good job. Clean is whatever the Coast Guard tells us. They set the priority there. They're, they're the judge on the beach. If they say the beach is clean, it's clean. But clean proved a relative matter, tough to define. Phase one is a gross decontamination or removal of all of the oil that can possibly re be removed uh, so that there will be no further re-oiling. Phase two, is a cleanup of those heavily oiled areas that even at this point have no chance of re-oiling. However, the oil will be removed um, at that point. A phase three uh, cleanup will be an actual physically removing all contaminants. Seeking clarity, in May we checked the first mile declared clean on Little Smith Island. Wow. Irvine, away in March, saw the damage for the first time. Still under. Oh, yeah. Kind of overwhelming, you know. Oil or cleaning killed piles of snails and limpets. Normally they would be just really tight on these rocks. Yep. And this is a clean beach. So Look at that. Look at that. God damn. Look what they've done, man. The oil that brought sobs to a grown man's heart clung as tar to the many harbor seals caught in the slick. Parts of the sound that were heavily oiled, up to 95% of the seals are in fact oiled. When the pups are first born, they spend a lot of time hauled out on the rocks, a lot more than they will later on in the year. And uh, they haul out in that intertidal area on a lot of the seaweed or fucus that's been heavily oiled. Other effects were invisible. One thing about harbor seals is that they spend a lot of hours of the day cruising around through areas like this 
and when they do that, they keep their eyes and their nose just above the surface of the water. So we're concerned that there was a very high level of toxic fumes that the seals would be breathing hour after hour and that their eyes would be exposed to. And in fact, it looks like some of the seals that have died have had very high levels of hydrocarbon in their tissues. Apparently, they're finding remnants of oil in the myelin sheath around the brain, in the optic nerve, things like that, which I don't think any of us particularly expected ahead of time. In August, I returned to the Night Island beach I had walked right after the accident. Cleaning was now called treatment and did not extend very far beneath the surface. How clean is clean? In one spot, I did not have to dig at all. What's the most surprising is the absence of wildlife, dead silence, and the waves breaking. The spill fouled 75% of the salmon grounds. Did you go out uh, salmon fishing? I went out on the sound until it was closed due to oil contamination of people's gear. Loose oil still in the water soiled all it touched, needing constant rinsing at special cleaning stations. But the fishing community could at least whip the rewards of having saved the San Juan hatchery. Because no oil penetrated the barriers of boom, nearly four million salmon could be harvested when they returned to spawn in summer. The popping keeps fish inside nets not yet fully closed. Some large salmon can be worth as much as a barrel of oil. Had the spill occurred in spawning season, this entire catch would have been lost. In August, cleaned otters awaited release and scientists reflected. Those initial days of the oil spill, I think, were the most critical for the sea otters or for any of the wildlife. We had certainly a, a large financial backing. We had a lot of expertise that was up here, but we didn't have time. And because of that, I believe we need to get these contingency plans as well as contingency facilities put in line. Without that, you're gonna lose a lot more wildlife than we lost here. And even so, we feel like we've lost more animals than we would have initially if those plans had already been in place. <laughs> Naturally grooming fur, now rid of oil, nearly 200 otters returned to the wild, but over 1,000 were known dead. About 800 birds were released. But Kelly Weaverling, the hero of the rescue, understood its limits. Every bird that we managed to rescue uh, was a success, certainly. I must say, though, that as hard as we worked with all the people that we had out there, our effect was very small. Uh, the lesson is that you, you can't clean it up. You can't collect and clean the birds. 
You just can't let the oil loose. The cleanup generated a constant stream of oily waste, at least 25,000 tons. Most was burned in incinerators that did not always work or shipped to dumps in Alaska and other states. On September 15, Exxon pronounced cleanup down for winter, unveiling a new term for the status of the sound. Our objective, of course, is to restore it to an environmentally stable condition. We are not leaving. We're here and we care. We're leaving the beaches so that they will not harm the wildlife that's in the area. And again, I take it back to my rock from Green Island. There is some oil left on that rock. It doesn't rub off, but, but you know, it's not as clean as that side of the rock, but it is not environmentally harmful and it's not in inhibiting the wildlife restoration in the area. Now, I'll let you pick your definition of clean. I'm gonna tell you, we opted for being sure that we could take care of the, of the birds and animals in the area as our target. We recognize there are no absolutes in this business. And there is an, eco, an environmental trade-off in this thing. And that's the reason we're running the studies over the wintertime. So we're learning. We're uh, learning. Uh, you mentioned earlier that it was a big laboratory. We, the world's largest laboratory. We're conducting experiments here. Exxon showed clean rocks, but the state of Alaska showed rocks still oily. Treated beaches, for instance, are clearly not clean. Uh, whether you can make them cleaner or not is still a, a matter of speculation. Everybody can plead guilty to complacency here with a few exceptions, mostly from the environmental organizations who said that this kind of thing could happen. And how long do you estimate it's going to take before we have the technology to handle a spill like this? I wish I knew. It would make everybody sleep a lot better at night, I expect. Uh, the fact is that very little effort has gone into developing the kind of technology that we need to treat a spill this large. And back on Night Island, clean remained entirely relative. I've been on this beach three times shortly after the spill, in the middle of the cleanup effort, and this is the day after the cleanup crew has left. And this is still on those beaches, which have been declared environmentally stable. The fishing community, meanwhile, demanded oil spill prevention, aiming their boats in protest. We need better tankers, bow thrusters, double hulls, thicker hull plating, shorter lengths, and most importantly, containerized cargo. Get creative, but do something. Terminals are another problem. More oil enters the ocean each year from a variety of sources than from major spills. But I think the main thing that we learned is that no amount of money in the world is gonna restore our beaches to pristine. So we all need to reevaluate. What is it that Exxon can do for the environment right now. And there are options. They could be dedicating funds to building sanctuaries, to protecting or enhancing wildlife and wilderness areas. The spill also attacked community balance. Crime and domestic violence increased and worry swept through people's hearts, as Michelle O'Leary observed six months after our first meeting. How do you sum up this old nightmare? I think now we're faced a lot with still the psychological impact, a um, lot of depression here in town because there's still a lot of oil out there and uh, the tremendous loss of bird and sea life has been devastating to us and we're still not sure what to expect next year. Um, the fishermen haven't been fully compensated and we don't know if the runs will return as strongly as they should. Did you go out uh, cleaning, uh, skimming? Yes, yes, I, I put two months on the oil field. So you got some good money there? Yes. I, that, 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 that got me by. Otherwise, I'd have been a, a cooked goose. Did you go fishing after that? Yes. Yeah. And how was the season? Uh, very poor. The impact of this big money 
no money syndrome has, has been kind of an interesting thing. As you're probably aware, about 60% of the fleet got contracts on oil spills at some time or another and received a, a, a major financial uh, boost from that. And about 40% of the fleet and most of the people in Cordova didn't realize any any income, as a matter of fact, lost income as a result of the Was spill. that because they didn't sign up for the cleanup or they didn't have a chance to sign up? Uh, was it an ethic? There was Part of it was ethics. Some people didn't do it because they needed to be able to speak freely about the issues. And once you were on the payroll of either Vico or Exxon, you signed a contract that said that you'd no longer speak about the issues you were involved in, the spill or, or your right. job in it. But as the last workers left, some did feel free to speak. So overall, you felt that uh, the spill was good for people. I can't say I, you know, I, I can't say for the long run, but uh, as far as the economy and uh, the people right now, yes, it's been good. The, the financial end of it has been good. I worked on the oil spill. Is that good money? Yeah, that's good money. How long have you been out there? A couple months, a few months. They've just uh, laid you off now? Yeah, just laid us off. And what are you going to do? Unemployment. <laughs> what do you think this has done to, uh, to Alaska, this big spill? It's helped the economy a lot. It has helped the economy? Yeah. So, seen from your point of view, it's a good thing? Yeah. Yeah. So you welcome oil spills? Well, I welcome the money from the oil spill, put it that way. I'm a chief engineer on a towboat. Yeah. I came up here, I, in fact, I left Seattle three hours before the oil spill happened. And if you want to know who the real criminals have been in this oil spill, remember there was a very short blurb about the fact that those tankers weren't manned by the number of people they used to be manned by? Right. They aren't manned anymore towboats aren't manned anymore. And then when all said and done, this is why accidents like this happen. You think that's directly linked with the accident? You bet I think it's linked to it. Why? What would have happened if there'd have been three more ABs standing on watch? And the AB had been screaming in the telephone, we're on the wrong side of the green light, boss. We're on the wrong side of the green light. Every time one of these things ends, I apply for work. I have not been out of work for years. Governor, you heard during the press conference that uh, little child who asked you questions, uh, are we ready for, for it if it happens again? Are we ready? Not really. If a spill of this size happens again, uh, we will be in not much better shape to, to clear, clear it up uh, than we were last time. I hope this event is a catalyst that leads not only to major environmental legislation in other areas, uh, but which also uh, uh, look, makes the United States look at, at its energy plan. Uh, the United States doesn't have an energy plan uh, unless uh, you call nothing a plan. We were made to believe that everything was fine, we had a contingency plan. Do you believe that uh, the community has lost confidence in our institutions? It's absolutely true that people do feel they were let down by the industry, by the government. Well, we know now that an oil spill or an environmental disaster is a social and emotional disaster. Salvaging hope, Dr. James Scott nursed eagles at the center built entirely by volunteers. Some came from Anchorage. We had attorneys, we had doctors, we had secretaries, everybody pounding nails. It was quite a time. Go ahead, we'll go in here and catch the rest of the crew. Thank you. What we'll be doing today is to, there'll be a group of us line up across here, and uh, we're going to pull that curtain across and hold the eagles behind, and then we'll do our catching behind there. Nine months after the spill, about 150 bald eagles were known dead. Most nests were barren since a single drop of oil can kill an embryo. Eagles still recovered from anemia and other oil-related sickness awaiting release. So you slide it on to the head like this. Okay. 
The hood quiets the great birds. Calm without sight, they can be examined and weighed. The eagle in my arms would never again command the wild. Trying to fly with oil-coated feathers, it had broken a wing, eventually amputated. Despite its wounded strength, I felt reverence holding the symbol of America. What is the objective of uh, all that blood taking? Well, by following these birds uh, with serial blood samples, we can tell the, the long-term ramifications of ingestion of oil. Talons and beak are painlessly buffed, growing too quickly without natural use. The hood for this eagle was blindness in one eye. There were a lot of eagles died before they ever got anything going for them. And uh, there were eagles turned loose back into the sound after they'd been captured that I think should not have been turned back into the sound because the sound wasn't safe at the time. No one really knows if it's safe even now. Have you learned anything from this accident? Well, we've learned that we need to have a response team that is worldwide, something that can be there that doesn't take uh, many, many meetings in order to make decisions. Before the Exxon Valdez ran aground, the Alaska Contingency Plan considered a serious accident highly unlikely, all the more unlikely because only American ships and American captains would be involved in the shipping of oil. But the Valdez was an American ship with an American captain. The plan said that if oil was spilled, it would be easily cleaned, assuming the sea, quote, remain in a state conducive to oil cleanup, unquote. In other words, Good weather for a bad accident. The plan pictured the hypothetical event that might occur on a calm June morning with a long day of daylight ahead. But the accident actually happened in the middle of the night in March. The plan said ill-fated tankers might be carrying 500,000 barrels of oil. In fact, the Exxon Valdez had just taken on one million barrels of oil. And finally, the plan called for putting a boom all around the leaking vessel, but Exxon later stated that doing so might have caused the ship to explode as the oil vapors rose and risked being ignited. In other words, a crucial element of the contingency plan called for turning a stricken vessel into a potential bomb. All in all, the plan was clear and just about totally wrong. Weak planning had a long history and a former Alieska worker, Chet Simons, told me he was fired in 1982 for complaining. What was your role uh, at Alieska? I was a uh, berth operator in the Marine Department. And then uh, for, the, about, for about five years, and for about three years, I was in the oil spill department and uh, helped set up the contingency plan that was scrapped. As time went on and they never had an accident, they figured, well, we don't need this. We've never, we've never had an oil spill. We don't need this, and you can put this equipment away in storage and uh, just basically breaking down the contingency plan. Did and you have a say as a responsible person there? I mean, someone who had a role? Um, I could say a lot and, and did. I was very outspoken. But you had to be very careful because that isn't the kind of person they wanted working there. They wanted someone who would just go to work, do their job, keep your mouth shut, and go home. People have said the plan was inadequate. It was inadequate relative to being able to cope with a catastrophic spill of 260,000 barrels. Doing the same mistake again and again. Not, we are technologically not prepared to face an Exxon Valdez again. Well, there are a number of things you have to do, and that's because we realize 
that it's extremely difficult to keep oil off the beaches. Uh, what we you do, them not. no, no. What we do is we we keep it from happening. That's the reason we emphasize in our plan prevention. Sure. Prevention what about is. In case it happens, oh, you know very well it's going to happen again. It may, it may. You can't say it definitely will. If a ship is going to get into trouble, you can keep it from happening. That's where the solution to the problem is. Not once it gets out on the water. If it's a large it instantaneous. Then you call... Nothing can prevent us, you or me, from saying that it will never happen again. Oh, no. But on the other... Uh, the life so if it does, You can't say it definitely will. But if it does, yes. well, are we prepared to do it? We're Technologically, are we prepared to pick up that oil? Yes or no? We will have to continue to develop our technology. We've learned something from this. We've learned that we have to do more in the area of research. And it's being formulated now that effort's being put forth and will continue to be put forth. That's what we have to do because, again, as you say, we can't guarantee that it would never happen again. It did happen again. Three spills in a weekend, then another in California, then Madeira, and in Morocco, a spill twice the Valdez ignored for 10 days. Accident response has barely improved since the Amoco Cadiz broke in half of France in 1978, bleeding six times the oil lost in Alaska. But oil, after all, is not the most dangerous substance on which we depend. The central hospital at Bhopal was littered with 500 bodies, and there were 500 more at medical centers and morgues around the central Indian city, all victims of what may yet become the worst industrial disaster in history. In 1984, no so-called controls contained the deadly cloud of pesticide, and for the people of Bhopal, no evacuation plan. But what of the ultimate toxic material? This is a simulated reconstruction of the explosion that blew the roof off the reactor and sent some 50 million curies of radioactive debris into the atmosphere. In 1986, the Chernobyl nuclear explosion occurred as workers check safety systems. No greater warning of the greatest failure now in our power. Tragedies like the Exxon Valdez can happen any day in the world, anywhere there are ships. My father came to Washington, D.C. to speak about the importance of protecting the vast continent of Antarctica. This last pure place long reserved to science lies at risk for minerals and oil, its vulnerability surpassed only by the magic known to all who journey there. And I would like to talk to you about this trip to Antarctica a little bit. To Antarctica, this almost mythical land lying at the southern end of the world. I spent three months there on board my ship Calypso with all the facilities and the best crew I had. And I will never forget the pristine beauty and the majesty of the sceneries above and under water. Imagine a, an accident like the Valdez in Antarctica. Everything is against and experience with the tiny little oil spill of the Bahia Paraiso uh, should be a warning for us. Wrecked in early 1989, the Argentinian ship remained unsalvaged a year later, still holding barrels of oil, a sliver compared to the Valdez. Towed to dry dock for repair, the stones of Prince William Sound still bulging from its single hull. A double hull or bottom may have reduced the spill by 60%. Double hull ship which gives you both protection against the grounding as well as protection against a side collision. It's certainly feasible technically, there's no question about that, but what you do is for a given size ship such as this, you would lose one third to two fifths of the cargo carrying capacity. So for what remaining capacity that exists, 
you're paying the reciprocal of that, maybe maybe one and a half times the price for your transportation cost. Now, does society want to pay that? Yeah, I think we do. The buoy at Bly Reef marks more than the mistakes at Valdez. Exxon executives canceled the promise interview citing pending legal problems. And so for me, a voice is left unheard. But the meaning of Valdez does not lie in the past. As we approach the new century, will we forget it took only ordinary rocks to wreck a once vast flagship, to shave away paint, twist hard steel, tear thick plates? Double hulls could be an answer along with double engines, captains and co-captains, smaller ships and traffic control as tight as for airplanes. But an age tempting with audacious technology also needs renewed respect for public trust, conservation, humility, to protect the environment that sustains our dreams. We have choices within our grasp. Let us mold the decade of solutions, lest the future fall to fragments at our touch. <laughs>